while uh, waiting for our uh, Sabbath school uh, superintendent today, let us sing more uh, songs of praise. Open your hymnals to hymn number 44. Morning has broken, 4-4. Four, four. suggestion opening song okay uh, let's all stand and sing uh, hymn number 316 live out the life within me 316 for our opening song
Good morning. Um, you may be seated. And we're going to have our scripture in a minute, but I'd just like to um, say happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Sometimes we have delays, but you know, God knows why things happen. I had to go back home for something. And I said, you know, I'm not worrying about it. God knows why I was delayed. So I'm glad to be here on time and safely. So I'm glad that each and every one of you is here today and we welcome you to our Sabbath school. At this time, we'll have um, Sister Bertha Allen giving us our scripture reading. Good morning, church. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is taken from Genesis 41, 39 to 41. And it reads as follows. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Inasmuch as God have showed thee all these things, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne would I be greater than thee. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have said thee over all the land of Egypt. Here ends the ending of God's word. Your hands repair. Dear Lord, we come to you today for your blessing and for us to worship you. Please bless the others who are on their way here. Please bless the speaker who's peace put more wisdom in him. And please um, thank you for protecting us this past few weeks, Lord. And please bless people who are struggling. And thank you for waking us up this morning so we can worship you. But in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Um, we will have a unique um, lesson study review this morning. We'll be connecting to the review of a lesson to three events. And as soon as our AV team is ready, then we will connect. Uh, okay, uh, take it from there, our AV team. And we will watch the lesson review that will be presented to us by 3ABN. We will be uh, having the review until 10.15 uh, because we have a presentation for the special Sabbath before the Father's Day. Okay, yeah, so three, I mean, AV team take over. Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School. I'm John Lomakang. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We have been enjoying our study through the book of Genesis, haven't we? Amen. Wow. And uh, we've had fun together. We've learned a lot together, and I pray that that has been your experience too, as we've opened the book of Genesis from the fall, looking at the frailty of humanity and the glory of God through broken, ruined vessels. God can take any bad situation and reverse it to his honor and glory and for the betterment of every one of us. That's been the constant lesson. And we've read some stories that will cause you to blush 
and others that will cause you to praise God. And today is going to be another revelation. Joseph, Prince of Egypt. How did his life affect the lives of those in Egypt? Well, stay tuned. You'll find out. But right to my left is my good friend, uh, James Rafferty. Good to have you here, James. Good to be here, John. I am going to be covering Monday's lesson, which is Joseph confronts his brothers. Ooh, I can't wait for that one. And I know you have a good one. Jason, we haven't seen you all quarter, but good to have you here today. It's great to be here. I'm excited about this. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Joseph and Benjamin. Mm. Mm. And Jill, I always look forward to your expositorily uh, outlined approach to the Word of God. I am super excited about this lesson. I think it's one of my favorite the whole quarter. Okay, and Shelly, the lady from Texas. <laughs> the lady with the Texas here. <laughs> I am so excited to be here and I get to talk about how even human foibles, God, God's providence overrules humans' foibles, human foibles. That's a new word, foibles. I have to look Foibles. that one up. Say that <laughs> two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have you here. Well, Jason, we haven't seen you all quarter, so why don't you have our prayer for us today? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we have the opportunity and privilege to open your word and study together. And Lord, we just ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit as we study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 You know, we talked about the unusual providence of God in getting Joseph to the palace <laughs> in Egypt. And I talked about it from pits to palaces. God doesn't put you somewhere except there's a providential purpose behind it. Yeah. God doesn't just give us a position to, to lavish it or languish in it, but God puts us in places where he knows his name can be glorified, but it comes down to the decisions that we make. So we find in Genesis chapter 41, let's all go there together and what we're going to see is how God worked in amazing ways through the revelations that he allowed Joseph to communicate. The understanding of each of these revelations came from God mm -hmm. but the revelations themselves was an opportunity for God to be glorified. The, the text we have first is Genesis 41 verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about mm -hmm to do. I love that, what he is about to yeah. do. So anytime God reveals anything, God is always up to something. I've always stood back and have been amazed at how God has worked through the most unpredictable circumstances, even the most harrowing circumstances, even the most, uh, the circumstances that have caused you to pull over on the side of the road and say, Lord, I, I can't handle this. What's this all about? And I've had those experiences in my own life. When I, walked, when I came to church one day and I said, you know, have you ever had the feeling that this is the place you don't want to be? I don't want to be here right now. I need you guys to pray for me. And uh, people surrounded me and prayed for me. But I realized that God brings us to certain places that are for a number of reasons. One, refinement yeah. and also remembrance. Mm -hmm. When we forget God, he will find a way to remind us. And the Lord took Joseph through a series of catastrophic events to bring him to a place of prominence because the Lord loved Pharaoh just as much as he loved Joseph. Mm -hmm. That's amazing yeah. what the Lord did. Let's look at verses 37 to 57 as the narrative unfolds in the courts of Egypt. Speaking about the advice, this is Genesis 41. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. That's what happens when God is in charge of your life. Yeah. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Verse 44. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no man may lift his hand or foot 
in all the land of Egypt. That's powerful. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's some amazing power. He was in a prison not too long before that. Now he's giving commands and Pharaoh says, you say it, they will move. You don't say it, nobody's moving. Look at verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephnath Paneah. And he gave him as a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the, seventh, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. And Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. Mm. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of Ono, bore to him. So Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil in my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come. And Joseph, as Joseph had said, the famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there, were, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt, so all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Mm -hmm. What a story. Mm -hmm. And this has been a pattern throughout the entire lesson. The, the, the writer of the lesson has given us a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. But if you think about going through 13 lessons in 50 plus chapters, it's not an easy task. So it was necessary. And sometimes we skip through it and you miss the examples. So let's go to the question that was written by the constructor of our lesson. What is God's place in the success of Joseph? Now, what I liked about this, and I want to read exactly the way that the uh, person who wrote the lesson said, it says, Pharaoh selected Joseph to take charge, not so much because he had interpreted his dreams correctly and revealed the forthcoming problem of the land, but because he had a solution to that problem. You know, God has a solution to every problem. Amen. You may be in a circumstance today that you might wonder, is there a solution? Wait on the Lord and the solution will come. But the one thing that you could do that can reverse, that can make the situation more dire is try to bring about a solution <laughs> when God is not in it. Yeah. God brought a solution from a man who not too long before this was in a pit, but now everyone in Egypt knows who Joseph is. Genesis 30, 41 verse 37, the Bible reminds us about Joseph and the advice that God gives. So the advice was what? Good. good. In the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. When God gives you wisdom and understanding, nobody could counteract what God has revealed to you. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he will give it without withholding anything. And so also Joseph made it very clear that God was in charge of his life. Look at verse 38. This was the clear declaration that Pharaoh saw in the lives of, life of Joseph. Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? When you, when you look at the lesson, one of the things you find is that Joseph didn't tell Pharaoh it was imperative for him to accept his God, mm -hmm. but he allowed God to be reflected through his life. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you encounter people that may not want to be what you are doctrinally or spiritually, but that doesn't hinder you from allowing your life to be a place where God is being revealed. Mm -hmm. I've run into people that are secular and very, some political, some very secular, some don't want to hear about God at all. But I've learned this, and, and this is something we could learn. You know, there are people that are very wise in the ways of the world, but I've seen in many instances, I work for insurance, com insurance companies, banks, law firms, 
And I've seen whenever the conversation, even when I was a member of the uh, Sky Squires field, uh, 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 an RC airplane uh, club down here in Southern Illinois, I noticed that when difficult times came, the head of the club came to me one day and said, you know, my wife is going through difficulty. Can you pray for me? Mm -hmm. I never told him, I never preached to them on the field, but they saw something that in a moment of difficulty, he came to me and said, Amen. my wife is going through a difficulty. Can you pray for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right on that Sunday afternoon, right there at the Sky Squires Field, we're going to have it all, all of our model planes ready to fly. So when you live the life that you should live, God will direct people to you, not for your glory, but always for his. You find also, these are the things that uh, was evidence that God was in the life of Joseph. And what happens, what evidences should be revealed in the life of those who are led by the hand of God? Psalms 19, verse 7, notice what happens when we follow God's leading. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Joseph, at one point in his life, had a lot of learning to do. I love the way you pointed that out. He couldn't keep his mouth shut for his own glory, but now he's opening his mouth for the glory of God. He became wise. He used to be simple. Psalm 119 and verse 130, the entrance of your word gives light. It, give, it gives understanding to the simple. And when that understanding is revealed, all you've got to do is stand back and let God be seen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Not only that, jo jo Joseph recognized that it was not his actions but God's. Philippians 2.13 for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God can do for us also what he did for Joseph. And what was that? Here's the quick reminder. Psalm, Genesis 41, verse 33. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and a wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. God can give you discernment and wisdom and then put you in a position where he is glorified. Amen. Amen. James? Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. My name is James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, Joseph Confronts His Brothers. It's based on Genesis chapter 42. And like you said, John, the author of the quarterly wants us to read a lot. Read Genesis 42. Well, we're not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to summarize it because there's a lot here that the quarterly has brought out that I think is really good. So famine, the famine in the land really obliges Jacob to send his sons to Egypt. That's where we left off. There was a famine in the land. It wasn't just in Egypt, but it was in the whole land. And sometimes God works through the famines in our land to bring us to the place where we we can be helped, or we can be delivered, or we can be saved. And this is what's happening with Joseph. Now remember, Jacob hasn't seen his son forever, right? Mm. He believes he's dead, he's lost. And God is going to work through this famine, as he works through the famines in our lives, to bring a blessing to Joseph, to bring renewal to him, to reunite him with his lost son. And I think God is going to work through the famines in our lives to reunite us with our lost destiny, with our lost image, with the kingdom that God established on this earth that we would enjoy for, for all eternity. So ironically, it is Jacob who initiates this project. Now, God, I believe God is working on his heart because, of course, God has a purpose for him. And sometimes God speaks to us. He works on our hearts. And we don't know why it is that we make some of the actions that we do, but afterwards we see that God is working through the whole thing, through the whole process. So the unfortunate old man is a victim of circumstances beyond his control, thinking they're bad, but they're actually good. Unknowingly, he sets in motion an amazing chain of events that will lead him to being reunited with the son whom he has mourned for so long. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So the providential nature of this meeting is highlighted through two fundamental characters. First of all, it is seen as a fulfillment of Joseph dream, Joseph's dreams. Mm -hmm. Remember, the event was predicted in Joseph's dreams that your sheaves will bow down to my sheaf, right? That's Genesis 37, verse 7. This is now taking place. Joseph is identified as the governor over all the land, all right? That's uh, uh, Genesis 42, 6. And the Lord of the land, Genesis 42, 30, and 33. So Joseph's powerful position is in contrast with the need of his brothers who bow before him with their faces to the earth, Genesis 42, 6. When they go there to the to the governor of the land to try to get 
uh, victuals to try to get food um, to keep their families and their flocks alive. And then it goes on to say, the same ten brothers who mocked Joseph about his dreams and doubted their fulfillment. It says ten because there's twelve altogether. Joseph was number eleven. Benjamin, who hadn't been born yet, was number twelve. So second, this providential meeting is described as a response. The linguistic and thematic echoes between the two events underline the, characteristic, the character of just retribution. Now here we go. The phrase they said to one another in Genesis 42:21 was also used when they began to plot against Joseph in Genesis 37, verse 19. So they said to one another, here comes that dreamer of dreams. They said to one another, okay, the governor, he, and, and, and the story goes on. They also used this, the brothers also, when they were sojourning, when they were sojourning in prison, excuse me, it echoes the sojourn of, of Joseph when he was in prison in Genesis 43 and 4. In fact, Joseph's brothers relate what is, what is currently happening to them and what they did to their brother perhaps 20 years ago when they say, then said they one to another, we truly are guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when, we, when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Now, I kind of want to pause here for just a second. I, I, this is really significant mm -hmm. because sometimes when we turn away from good and we do evil, we close our ears and our eyes mm -hmm. to God's conflicting spirit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these brothers had not done that yet. And so they're coming to a place where they're remembering their evil mm -hmm. and they're regretting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're coming to a place and they're really, they're open to it. They're susceptible to, to think about what they did in the past mm -hmm. and to make a turn for the better. Mm -hmm. So we need to recognize sometimes when God reminds us of our past, you know, and sometimes that happens, you know, we get a guilt complex or Satan comes in there or whatever. Sometimes that's to bring us to a place where we stand before God guilty so that Romans 3.19, our mouths can be stopped. We can become guilty before God, and then we can be turned to Jesus Christ. We can Amen. be turned to His forgiveness. That's good. And that's what these brothers needed right now. And this is what they're going to accept, they're going to experience. So it goes on here and it says, Reuben's words, His blood is now required of us, Genesis 42, verse 22, is the echo of the past warning, shed no blood, Genesis 37, verse 22. So they reinforced the link between what they were now facing and what they had done. You know, every one of us is going to face, come, come face to face with the record of our lives. And, and God is calling us to come face to face with that record right now while there's a mediator in heaven. Amen. And while we can have forgiveness for our sins. Mm -hmm. That's what God designed. Some men's sins are open beforehand going to judgment and others they follow after. And those that follow after can't be hid. God wants to hide our iniquities. He wants to hide the history of our sins. The whole thing is going to be blotted out. God wants to do that for every single human being That's right. on planet Earth. That's really what the investigative judgment is all about. It's not a negative thing. It's, it's, it's part of the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. So it must be a good thing. It must be good news. Mm -hmm. So most of us surely have done, the lesson quarterly says, things for which we are sorry. So how can we, to whatever degree possible, make up for what we've done? Also, why is accepting God's promise of forgiveness through Jesus so crucial for us? Why is it so important for us? And how can we, how can we make amends? Well, one of the ways I think it's really important for us to recognize and make amends is, as Joseph's brothers did, to think about our past when the Spirit convicts us mm -hmm. and to allow God to give us that remorse or that regret. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid. If you've made a mistake, don't be afraid to acknowledge it. This was the, was the experience of, of the famous leaders of the Old Testament, like David, for example, who, Jill, you brought out in our last session, acknowledged his sins and iniquities in Psalm 51, right? Against thee and thee only have I sinned, because really, ultimately, all sin was paid for by God. That's right. God wants us to experience forgiveness. Now, what's really interesting, I'm just going to jump back here to Genesis 41. John, you covered that chapter, but just one verse mm -hmm. that I think is really significant. Verse 51, it says that Joseph named his son Manasseh because God has caused me to forget all of my father's house and all of my trouble. Now, that word Manasseh, it's a really significant word. It means in the root to forgive, to remit, or to remove. God has caused me to forget. In other words, Joseph had come to the place where God had caused him to forget and in a sense forgive what his brothers had done to him. That's because right. Joseph had realized God's brought all this evil for good. Yeah. God praised the Lord. And so God does that in our lives. 
God works in our lives so that he can actually heal us. Mm -hmm. He can bring forgiveness to us, even if other people who have hurt us are not in the picture yet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that forgiveness comes first to us before the other people are even in the picture. Joseph's yeah. brothers aren't in the picture yet. You're right. He hasn't even seen them, but he's already feeling the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. God and says, I'm going to name my first son, I'm going to name him Manasseh. And by the way, Dan is not present in Revelation chapter 7, the sealing chapter. You know, you have the 12 tribes there symbolized. Mm -hmm. Dan is gone because Dan is an adder in a way. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But, but he's replaced. There's still 12 tribes there. And the one who places him is Manasseh, the okay. one who forgives or the one who causes to forgive. Now, but I think this is significant. Even though Joseph forgives his brothers, he still tests them when they show up. Just because we forgive people doesn't mean we just bring them right into the circle again and we just trust them, right? We can forgive people and still have a little bit of a, uh, a boundary there, right? Mm -hmm. We can have a little bit of a boundary there and say, wait a minute, I want to see if these guys have changed. I mean, when we look at the stories of the Old Testament, we see this over and over again. For example, Job, he prayed for his friends, his miserable, comforter, worthless physician friends. He prayed for his friends, right? But he still challenged them when they said, yeah, Joseph, you're, I mean, J Job, you're, you know, your theology's off. No, it isn't. Uh, you don't believe, I do believe in God. He still stood up to them, right? Mm -hmm. So our attitude toward others or forgiveness or prayer of intercession doesn't mean that we just acquiesce to what they believe. What they, we don't have to be what others say we are. We are what God calls That's us right. to be. Mm -hmm. And we see this in David too. You know, David had this attitude of forgiveness towards Saul, but he didn't head back to the palace, you know. He maintained his distance. He had healthy boundaries. And Joseph has set up these healthy boundaries. I want to see if these brothers have changed, if they're different. And I'm going to put a little test in, in place here. And so when Joseph's brothers come, we see the whole, and this is the whole scenario of, uh, of Genesis chapter 42. He tests them. He decides, you know, I'm going to put the cup in there and I'm going to put the silver back and I'm going to see how they treat Benjamin. I'm going to see if Benjamin will come. I'm going to put one of them in prison. I'm going to test these guys. And you know, they, they bear that test. They accept their situation. And eventually, as jo Joseph reveals himself, they confess, indeed, that they had sinned. They confess it not just to Joseph, but also to Jacob. Mm -hmm. right. And reconciliation takes place. You know, forgiveness brings reconciliation mm -hmm. to all of our relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is all about. Mm -hmm. so thank you. That's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, also, what we, I've been mentioning the writer of the lesson. I want to just acknowledge Jacques uh, B. Ducan, mm -hmm. who has done an excellent job in constructing this lesson with an entire wonderful committee. But uh, we have more for you to enjoy. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Book Tuesdays. journey is perhaps one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, there are so many lessons that can be gleaned from his experience, but I'd like for us to start by looking at his father, Jacob. Mm. Uh, there's somewhat of a natural order to life, and what I mean by that is uh, that parents aren't supposed to outlive their children. Mm. Uh, it's unfortunate that death is currently a part of life, and I can't think of anyone that I know that hasn't experienced the loss of a loved one. I know for me, I've lost consistently uh, about two, uh, two loved ones, two family members per year for five or six years in a row. Mm. Death is painful, yeah. and traumas from tragedies can make us slower to move and sometimes leads us to a state of analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. I want us to look at several verses, and you'll notice a common thread here. Uh, the first verse I want us to look at is Genesis chapter 37, verse 35. And you may want to write these down because we're going to move through these rather quickly. Uh, but Genesis chapter 37, verse 35 says, And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused mm. to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. 
Genesis chapter 42, verse 38. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Perhaps by now you're noticing the common thread, but we'll look at Genesis chapter 42, verse 4. It says, But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, Lest some calamity befall him. It is only when we are placed in des a desperate situation that we take desperate action. And as the lesson points out, Jacob could not easily allow the departure of Benjamin, his only son with Rachel, who remained with him. He was afraid that he would lose him as he already lost Joseph. It is only when there was no more food and when Judah pledged to guarantee the return of Benjamin that Jacob finally consented for a second visit to Egypt and allowed Benjamin to go with his brothers. And I can only imagine that Jacob's level of anxiety must have been at an all-time high. Uh, Genesis chapter 43, verses 13 and 14. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. Mm. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Mm. And I can picture him saying that with, with such pain and, and passion in his voice. It's interesting. Uh, according to Dr. Kevin Fleming, persistent complex bereavement disorder is a DSM-5 diagnosis assigned to individuals who experience an unusually disabling or prolonged response to bereavement. Mm. Some of the symptoms of PCBD uh, that stood out to me as it could possibly have pertained to Jacob's situation were feeling shocked, stunned, or numb since a loved one's death, feelings of disbelief or inability to accept the loss, rumination about the circumstances or consequences of the death, trouble trusting others, intense reactions to memories or reminders of the deceased. Mm. The thing that continues to blow my mind is that Jacob's grief or his bereavement uh, fell under false pretenses. In other words, Joseph wasn't dead. Mm. And the actions of his brothers caused their father an immense amount of pain for an extended period of time okay. and impacted his decision-making process. Mm. Now, I don't want to sound too cliche, but it's important that we're cognizant that of the choices that we make, realizing that they don't just impact us. Mm. That's right. They have long-lasting ramifications mm. for others as well. The lesson poses the question, what effect had Benjamin's presence on the course of events? I'd like to submit to you that Benjamin was the spiritual barometer by which Joseph measured the fruit of his brother's lives. Allow me to unpack that. Matthew chapter 7 verses 18 through 20 says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And verse 20, therefore by their fruits you will know them. Mm -hmm. Joseph tested his brothers on multiple occasions as you brought out uh, earlier, Pastor Rafferty. And I love this quote that's found in Patriarchs and Prophets and saw on pages 228 and 229. It says, Joseph sent messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's was five times as much as any of his brothers. By this token of favor to Benjamin, Joseph hoped to ascertain if the youngest brother was regarded with the envy and hatred that had been manifested toward himself. Still supposing that Joseph did not understand their language, the brothers freely conversed with one another. Thus, he had a good opportunity to learn their real feelings. Still. He desired to test them further, and before their departure, he ordered that his own drinking cup of silver should be concealed in the sack of the youngest. Mm. There are a couple of key takeaways. Number one, Joseph valued family and sibling unity. Mm -hmm. Number two, the ministry of reconciliation 
is our responsibility. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, normally we stop right there. We say, Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But we're going to continue to verses 18 through 20 because you have to catch this. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through That's Jesus right. Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Amen. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Point number three, sometimes it's in our darkest moments that God's light shines the brightest. Mm -hmm. Joseph possessed qualities that were needed in trials. And so let's take a look at those qualities. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Mm. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, mm. slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Mm. Point number four. Sometimes separation is preparation for our eternal destiny. God took the tragedy that occurred in Joseph's life and turned it into a triumphant saving grace. Amen. That's right. And finally, point number five, we all experience trials, and that's a fact. Mm -hmm. How can we profit from trials? James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Mm. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally mm. and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So the question I leave you with is, who do we reflect as we're going through our trials? Amen. Great job, Jason. I love that. Um, each one of you, thank you for the lesson. I am Jill Morricone, and I have Wednesday's lesson, the Divination Cup, but I actually took the liberty to rename this lesson. My name for it is True Repentance Revealed. Because that's what we see in Genesis chapter 44. As we've seen already in, through this journey, Joseph was sold as a slave when he was 17. He spent 10 years in Potiphar's house, three years in prison. He's 30 when he became governor of Egypt mm. over all the land. There were seven years of plenty and the famine began. Be so it's been a while mm -hmm. since he has seen his father. We're talking years. Now it's interesting. Why did it take Joseph so long to reveal who he was to his brothers? When Pastor James had his lesson in Genesis chapter 42, Joseph could have said, hey guys, I'm Joseph, <laughs> but he did not. And there has to be probably at least a year or more than a year from Genesis 42 till we get down to Jason and my lesson because they were there in Egypt. They went all the way back to Canaan. They ate and ate and ate and used up all the food. And then finally, Daddy Jacob gives permission for Benjamin to go with the brothers back to Egypt. So this is quite a while. And then Joseph still has the meal and gives more portions to Benjamin. And still he does not immediately reveal who he is. You see in Genesis 42, as Pastor James brought out so well, there was conviction and there was regret. The Holy Spirit was working, bringing conviction. What did they do to Joseph? There was regret. But I don't think you see true repentance till you get to Genesis chapter 44. I divided it into three sections. We have the setup the brother's response, and then Judah's intercession, which is my favorite part. So let's look at the setup. We are in Genesis 44, verses 1 through 5. And he, this is Joseph, commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup 
the silver cup in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. I'm sure they were happy they'd had this feast. Benjamin gets to go back. Simeon's released. Everything's going well. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, get up. Follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Hmm. Is not this the one from whom which my Lord drinks, and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So they were set up, the brothers were, to make it look like they had stolen. They had stolen the money, and they had also stolen the divination cup. Hmm. Siphomancy, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Siphomancy is divination, using a cup or a goblet. Mm. It may involve forecasting by using a cup of water and reading the signs represented by certain articles that are floating in the water. It's considered one of the oldest methods of foretelling the future by means of crystalline reflection, both in ancient Egypt and in Persia. So divination with liquids was common. But it was strictly forbidden. We know that in Leviticus, you shall not eat anything with blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. So why does Joseph even make it appear as if he's using the divination cup? Because that's clearly not biblical. I would say there's three reasons. First, the divination was a means of acquiring information. Joseph used the cup to acquire information, not by pouring liquid into it in some sort of seance with trying to foretell the future. He did it by testing his brothers. That's how he used it to acquire information. Had they really changed? Were they repentant? Uh, the second reason I see is that taking of the divination cup increased the guilt of the offender. It would have held great financial and spiritual significance in the land of Egypt. So if one of the brothers was found to have the divination cup, it would be a huge deal for them there in Egypt. And the third reason is the divination cup would indicate to the brothers that Joseph could read their hearts. Mm -hmm. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 229. Joseph had never claimed the power of divination, but he was willing to have them believe that he could read the secrets of their lives. Once again, it's putting pressure on them. Now let's look at the brothers' response. The first response is that of innocence. Who, us? We didn't take the money. We didn't do anything. Why would we take the cup? Their second response is one of smugness, one of cockiness. We are so certain that we didn't take the cup, that whoever's bag has the cup, you can kill them. Mm. That's smug, right? We're certain that we didn't take the cup. And the steward kind of modifies the sentence, says, no, they're not going to be killed, but they'll just be the slave. Hmm. They will become a slave. Now we see the true repentance being revealed because the brothers could have said, what? Okay, it's in Benjamin's cup. Good riddance. He's going back to Egypt. We're going home to daddy. We're not concerned about it like they had done with Joseph, right? He's gone. We don't care. We're going back to dad. We don't care if we break our father's heart. We don't care if we hurt him. We don't care what our sin has cost. But instead, they all tore their clothes. Instead, they all returned to Egypt with Benjamin. Takeaway number one, true repentance acknowledges my own sin and doesn't point fingers at others. Really interesting to learn from uh, the final uh, discussion being conducted with 3 ABN, but uh, we have a special program also this morning, so I'm sorry to cut the uh, review of our lesson short, and now we will give the time to our Sabbath school superintendent to move on to the next uh, portion of our Sabbath school program. Happy Sabbath and good morning, church. For the sake of time, we will just be collecting the mission story offering. May the deacons now come up.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for everything I've done for us. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for bringing us today. Please help us to glorify your name while we come to you today and worship your holy name. Please help us to give, give and give more to you and offer you what we are tithed and offerings that we that you have given us this week. And thank you very much for everything I've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Well, what today is June 18th, right? And what is tomorrow? Father's Day tomorrow. So today, on behalf of the Women's Ministry and Pompano Beach SDA Church, we would like to honor our fathers today. And so, what consists of a good father? A good father is, some would say, the glue that holds a family together. A good father makes all the difference in a child's life. He's a pillar of strength, support, and joy. His work is endless and sometimes thankless. But in the end, it shows in the sound, well-adjusted children he raises. Amen? A good father loves his children, but he doesn't let them get away with everything. He might disapprove of his children's misdeeds, using tough love to prove a point, but he does so through the power of God. Good father serves God. A good father, they're men of action. Good fathers, prepare their children for adulthood. Good fathers take responsibility, and good fathers are reliable. How many children that are here today have their fathers with them? Okay, all right, so just a few. I'm sorry? How many children that are here have their fathers here with them today? Okay, so just a few. When we think of, uh, you know, we have the acronyms for father, 
F, the six attributes of a godly father. The F in father stands for faithful. Good fathers are faithful. The A in father stands for action. Good fathers are people of action. The T in father stands for teacher. Good fathers are teachers. The H in father stands for hope. Good fathers offer hope to their families. The E in father stands for example. Good fathers are a positive example. And finally, the R in father stands for reliable. Good fathers are reliable. Can our fathers please stand? All our fathers, please stand. Let's give our fathers a hand. OK. What we would like to do, we have um, gift bags up here. I would like for our women and our children that have their fathers here, can you come up and get a bag for your dad? And the women, Sister Hope, can you come up? Women's ministry, come on up. And just make sure that each dad gets a bag, please. Just take a bag and give it to a dad that's standing or your dad. We just want to remind you fathers, no matter where you are in the journey of fatherhood or what feelings, once you get your bag, you can feel free to sit. Thank you. Every dad should have a bag. No one should be standing at this point. There's a gentleman in the back, brother. Can, can you give him a bag, please? Two bags, take bags with you and give them to each. So everyone should have a bag. Did all our fathers get a bag? Did everyone get a bag? If you didn't, raise your hand. Did you get a bag in the back? Did he get one? Your husband? Sister, sister, sister Hope? Or sister in the yellow sweater? Did her husband get a bag? Yes? OK, dads, no matter where you are in the journey of fatherhood or what feelings you have about your own fathers, we just want to remind you that you have access to a God who is father to all. So our gift to you is a reminder that you are blessed, you are loved, and you are appreciated. Put your faith in Jesus Christ today and follow our Heavenly Father's example, and you will be a good, godly father, not perfect, but prepared to lead and love and serve your family. God bless you on this Father's Day. Let us pray. Eternal Father of God in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day. I thank you that you have brought us here safely thus far. I pray that you will be with all those that are on their way today to worship you. We thank you for this Sabbath day, dear God. Lord, we thank you for all the fathers, those that are here and those that are online, those that are on their way to church. I pray that you will be with them. Continue to guide them, Father God. Use them, Lord, in your ministry. Help them to be good examples, not just to their children, but to 
you know, other children in the community, help them to be a good father figure, Father God, a godly father. And so I pray that you will bless each and every one of them. I pray that you will continue to give them hope, give them courage, give them strength, Father God, as they live your life day by day. Thank you again, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We will now have our special music by Sister Louisa. Good morning all and happy Sabbath. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved that you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude, all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done with his power. My voice is cracking today, but it's all to God's glory.
Good morning, church. Um, this morning, I'm here to uh, promote the topic on education. And, um, okay. You know, within the Seventh day Adventist Church, the Seventh day Adventist Church believes are meant to permeate the whole life of a human being. And that includes education. Jesus Christ, our God, he taught men and women from ever since the, uh, the beginning of this earth that they should be able to live a full life holistically and experience the true experience that God has for us. Same day Adventists believe are meant to permeate this whole life. The, the same day, within the same day Adventist Church, there's a lot of educational institution that help promote a well-rounded education for our students. Most of us, our students attend public high schools and public institution. But the ideal education is a rounded Christian education where men and women, our children can learn about God from, an, from birth until death. But we understand there are certain economic situations, logistics, and so forth. And I'm not here to find any excuses or whatever. But the majority of us gain our education through our home, from our family, and also through the public institutions that has been presented in various countries. But education is a very important factor within the Seventh-day Adventist organization. The Seventh-day Adventist Church promotes education no matter what age you are, you can receive a good rounded education. Even within our local churches here, certain programs that we have, certain departments that we have is here to educate our members holistically. And here at Pompano, we are doing the same to help each one of us grow. The same day Adventist Church consists of over 8,000 institutions across the global, across the world. Education is key to humanity, to us to survive throughout the society. Since the early days, Adventists have embraced the philosophy that educating, education should be a redemptive in nature for the purpose of restoring humankind to the image of God, our creator. Mental, physical, social, and spiritual health, intellectual growth, and service to human, humanity form a core of values that are essential aspect of the Adventist educational philosophy. Seventh-day Adventist believes in great schools because they know that getting a well-rounded education is a wonderful way to fall in love with Jesus and prepare for life services. We have a responsibility to take care of our children to help them to gain the best knowledge so they can face society in this very secular society. They need to be well-rounded, both physical, spiritual, and emotionally, so they can present the word of God to, to a lost world, but also able to be gain, gain full employment in the society and have the principles and the belief system that we taught them to handle the corporate environment that they might face. We here at Pompano will be trying to emphasize the importance of education. Most of us come from different regions of the world, different backgrounds. Some of you had your education, um, attain your education in various countries. And sometimes you come to the United States, you have to restart over and continue. But overall, it's important that as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that our church emphasize the importance for us, all of us, to have some form of education. It might not be a PhD. It might, not, it might be a certification and certain skill sets. But within the Seventh-day Adventist Church organization, education is one of those programs that the church promotes. And here in Pompano, we want to promote that. So, you know, to continue with that aspect of promoting education, we here at Pompano will be 
setting aside next Sabbath as ed Education Emphasis Sabbath. Okay, and also we'll be celebrating uh, the graduates for the year 2022 in our church who have been graduated from elementary and high schools and some maybe from colleges and so forth. We'll be celebrating, with, celebrating their success and praying for them next week. So we're inviting everyone who is present here to come out next week, but also um, to take the time to invite somebody and congratulate our young people. Most of them are young people, ready right from college, they did very well. And in this country, those graduating from high school, it can be a challenge. There's a large percentage of high schoolers who does not make it to graduation. And in college, it's much worse. Okay, Thir only 30% of individuals who attend college, according to our statistics, finish college, graduate. That means 70% does not. So we need to pat ourselves on the shoulder in a graceful manner when our students, when our kids, our children, when our youth take a challenge, work hard, and to attain their education. And majority of your parents here understand the struggles and the financial constraints that has been placed upon you to help your child to be much better in this country. Ellen G. White says in the book, Education, page 225, through education does not ignore the value of scientific knowledge or literature requirements, but above information, it values power. Above power, goodness. Above intellectual requirements, character. The world does not so much need men of great intellect as of a noble character. Sister White also emphasized the very importance of education. And even through the days of segregation, the White family took the challenge to even reach out against certain norms and laws that all Adventists, whether you're black, white, pink, blue, wherever you're from, you should have an education. And the Sunday Adventist Church has always be the forefront runner of a good education. As we continue throughout this day, I'm going to continue to pray for your young people. But for next week, we're going to have also a guest speaker. He's the principal of the Sawgrass Adventist School, Pastor Robert Stevenson. So he will be our guest speaker next week. And as we celebrate with our graduates and our church, we are hoping and praying that you guys all come out, bring a friend, so we can have a successful day. Thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to invite this clerk as we make the um, announcement. Thank you. Good morning again, and um, happy Sabbath to everyone. Uh, happy Sabbath. Aren't we, aren't we happy to be in the house of the Lord today? This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. So good to have a day of rest from all our labors all week. So let us be happy to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Amen. 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 And I would like to give a warm welcome to each and every one of us here today and especially our guests. So I do not have a list of any guests with us, but I know we have some. So I'm going to ask you if you'd like to raise your hands or stand where you are so we can acknowledge you and welcome you. Brother Besta, I know there are some others. Could we stand or guess or just raise your hands? Whichever is comfy for you. Thank you for coming. Anyone else? Do we have any other guests? We have some hands on the back. Welcome to our church here at Pompano Beach. I hope this will not be your last time. Anyone else? I thought I saw some other people at the back. So you may be shy, but we'd just like to give you a warm welcome to be here with us today. And we know you will be blessed today as you worship with us. We have a few announcements. Um, first on the list is our weekly prayer meeting on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, many of us may forget that, but it's every week at 7. So we encourage you to come out, be blessed, because they do a lot of interesting studies. So you will be blessed. So as much as possible, you can make it on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. 
And this evening, our Adventist Youth Program will be at 6 p.m. and it will be on Zoom. And the ID and passcode is here in your bulletin if you'd like to join them. And everyone is invited. The AY department began a youth Bible study yesterday, and that started at 7.30 to 8.30, and that's on Zoom, and that will be every Sabbath evening, okay, Sabbath nights. So you're all invited to participate in that. And the Zoom ID and information is the same as for the AY program. Um, right after divine worship today, there will be a special fellowship meal to celebrate Father's Day. So you are all invited, and especially our fathers and our men who are here, please join us. And it's the last room on the right, second to last on the right, if you've not been here before. So that's right after divine service today. There's a special meal prepared for you. And um, if anyone is participating in divine service, we ask you at this time if you would go back to the back to get ready. And you should be there no later than 10.50. So if you're part of divine service today, please make your way to the pastor's office at the back to prepare for the divine worship. And Brother Owen just spoke about um, Education Emphasis Day. So, um, you know, that's going to be next week. You already gave your information on that. And there'll also be a fellowship meal right after the service next Sabbath, which is Education Emphasis Day. And everyone graduating this year, whether it's from kindergarten through to university, and we've had a few students who have graduated, high school, university, please submit your names to so Sister Juna Powell. Sister Powell, yeah, she's the head clerk. So please give your names to Sister Juna or to Victoria Serafin, who is our children's ministry leader, and you need to do this today. So if you have graduated, please give your name to these ladies. So we will have that for next week. And um, VBS, something interesting is coming up for those parents who are with us today. And if this, this is your first time, we have Vacation Bible School. For those of our visitors who may not know what this is about, but every year it's an annual thing, Vacation Bible School. And the theme for this year is Jasper Cannon. Cannon. Okay, and that will be from July 18 through 22 and it starts at 6 p.m. each day. So the activities will be Christ-centered and that will help the children to delve deeper into the Bible and find out how special they really are to God. So we're encouraging you parents or visitors, if you're here, you'd like to be a part of the Vacation Bible School, see anyone after church, the church clerk, the youth leaders, and we will help you to register for that event, okay? So that's July 18 through 22. There will be work B for the church on July 17, and that starts at 8 a.m., and all members are invited to come and help to maintain the upkeep of the church building and the grounds. So if you're able-bodied and you're able to help us, please come and join us on July 17. And the women's ministries, We'll be having some more in, um, activities. Women's Emphasis Day will be on July 9 and July 10. We have a special speaker coming on July 9th, and then there will be an annual tea party on July 10. The information is right here in your bulletin. So we have a dynamic speaker coming that day, Pastor Alexis Madrid. She'll be here for the weekend, and the event is entitled Women of Purpose. So we're inviting all our women and young ladies. You know, your young girls are invited to be a part of this. So come out and be blessed. We'll give you additional information as the time draws near. There's some additional information for an announcement on the back of your bulletin for those who have a bulletin. And um, after the fellowship meal today, uh, we will be reaching out to our community in different ways. Please stay and join us as we begin this community outreach program. So that's right after the fellowship meal today. And um, regarding our nominating committee and new officers for next year, our church officers will be serving a term of two years. So we will be finalizing the officers list this, at this month's board meeting. And if you have any questions, please contact the pastor, Pastor Verse. So, these are the announcements for today, and uh, may you be blessed as you worship with us.
I think we have an online um, announcement at this time. All right, have a blessed Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath day to all. We welcome everyone to our song service this morning and also I'm greeting our online viewers. Happy Sabbath day. Hope you will join us in our uh, songs, singing songs of praise to lift the name of the Lord. For our first song, let's open our hymnals to hymn number 524. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Five, two, four.
531, will your uncle hold? Uh, 531. Uh, we'll build on the rock. Oh, we'll build on the rock. Sorry about that. Open your hymnals to number 534. Will your anchor hold 534?
Fritz Olsen and sing Holy Ground. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning giving you praise and honor and glory. We come to worship before your great throne of grace. We come to love you this morning. We come to serve you. And Lord, we come to share your word this morning. So Lord, please bless us. Please send the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us. Lead us and guide us this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please open page number 15, My Maker and My King. One, five.
Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is going to be taken from Ecclesiastes 9, 1 through 10. For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love nor hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous, and to the wicked, to the good, and to the clean, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth. And to him that sacrificeth not, it is the good, so is the sinner. And he sweareth, as he feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are under that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also my heart of the sons of man is full of evil. The madness is in their heart while they live, and after they go to the dead. For him that is joined to all the living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead no, any, not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for their memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God no accepteth thy work. Let thy garments always be white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of vanity, which she hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. For that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it in thy might. For there is no work, nor device, no, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. It is prayer time, and I ask uh, that we all assume a, an attitude of reverence as we petition our Lord and Master that he may be with us uh, today. Most kind and precious Savior, Lord, we come to you this morning, first of all, to give you thanks for being here today. We thank you for life, 
We thank you that we've opened up our eyes this morning and we're able to see the sun. We thank you, Lord, for the loved ones that are in our lives, Father. Our children, our parents, our family members, our church brothers and sisters, and close friends, those whom we love and whom love us, Father. It is such a privilege and an honor, and it's a blessing to have those folks in our lives who continually to give us support and give us encouragement and give us a reason, Lord, to wake up every morning and, and take the first step. Lord, we also recognize that uh, there are those who are uh, in hospitals or in uh, different situations um, uh, physically and, and are going through illnesses and sicknesses, Lord. Father, we ask that you will bless those individuals, Lord, and heal them, Father. There are many different illnesses and sicknesses out there, Lord, especially now. And uh, we ask you to look down upon us, Father, and, and see our feebleness, Lord, and understand that and help us to understand that it is only you that can keep us safe from everything that's all around us. And there are those, Father, who, are, uh, who have passed on, family members. And uh, for those that are in our congregation, Father, those members of our church who are at this time traveling, we ask you to give them traveling mercies as they, as they make it to their different destinations, Lord, to, um, to bury their loved ones. Be with them, Lord. Comfort them. Comfort their families, Lord, as they're going through the grieving process. And help that they will return back to us safely. Uh, we're speaking of Brother Nate and, uh, and, his, and his wife, uh, the Mungin family. Comfort them, Lord, in their, in, their, in their time of need. And Lord, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention those who, are, who have gotten comfortable being out of church during this time of... Uh, COVID and, and, and COVID restrictions and closing of churches and, and, and the many different restrictions, Lord. They've gone home to watch television, watch, watch the sermons and different programs online. And Lord, we know that it's easier once we've departed from gathering, that it's easier to continue to stay away. But we've begun an in-reach program at the church, Father. And we ask that you will bless that approach, Father. We will bless that effort, Lord, that we will reach those who have uh, gone astray and are need to come back, Lord. I'm reminded of the prodigal son, Lord, who had left home and found himself in a most miserable condition, Father. Most miserable indeed. And at some point, he remembered how it was to be in the house of God, how it was to be safe, in his father's care. And then he reflected on his situation and what got him there. And then what did he do? He returned home, Father. So I'm reaching out to those members who are listening, Father, who have kind of lost their way. I'm asking them, Lord, to remember how it was to be in the house of the Lord. I'm asking them to reflect on what their life is like now and what it used to be. And I'm asking them to return home, Father, where you can encircle them with your loving arms. And Lord, I'm also asking for your support, your guidance in this lay Bible ministry, another effort that we've started here with this church, Father. We know that there are many members today who are out and are not, not able to attend. But Father, it is your initiative that we reach out to the folks in this community. And so we know that whatever you started, you will finish to the utmost. And so we have faith that whatever we put our hands to, in the name of Jesus, it will succeed. So we thank you, Lord, for that initiative. We thank you, Lord, for all those who have participated thus far. And we thank you for the success that we will have. And Lord, we ask you to bless our manservant today, Pastor Steve Verse. We ask you to anoint his lips, Lord, so that he will spit fire from this pulpit this morning and that we'll catch fire. And that we will leave this place inflamed, Lord, knowing that we have had time spent with you today. Help us, Lord, to have attentive ears and attentive hearts, Lord, to understand that our time here on this earth is short. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Being here in this world is an uncomfortable situation, and we're not always going to be comfortable. We may not like the things that people do. We may not like the things that people say. We may not like even our current circumstance, but Lord... We ask you to help us to understand that in this life, 
it is not, we're not looking for ease and comfort, Lord. We're looking for a relationship with you. So help us, Lord, to get to that place where we can look, ourselves in the, look at ourselves in the mirror and say, Lord, it is you that I give my life to. So continue to bless us throughout the rest of our Sabbath day, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. So in 1 Peter 1, verse 20, the Bible says, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. We give systematically and regularly because the divine model has demonstrated that God's giving to humanity was not an afterthought. The plan to offer his son and rescue humanity from sin was elaborated before the creation of the universe, and at the set time, Jesus came to earth. This clearly illustrates the consideration of a loving God for fallen humanity. In response to the example set by the greatest giver, the Apostle Paul gave the following admonition to the believers in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. He says, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up. Giving that is planned honors the receiver. Usually in our lives, when we want to show someone that they are special and that they matter to us, we usually mark our calendar and even add a reminder not to miss their important dates, like birthdays, anniversaries, graduations. The best expression of love is both spontaneous and planned. Which type of giver are we when we express love and thanks to God? Do we depend solely on the prompting of our impulses and feelings, or do we only remember about returning tithe and giving offerings when we see an expectedly higher balance on our bank statement at the end of the month? How do we honor the Savior who does not treat us as an afterthought? This week, as we worship with our tithe and, and our offerings, let us show that God is our first and our foremost thought. May the deacons and deaconesses please come forward.
please stand. Father, I want to ask you to please bless this offering that we've just given, and I want to ask that you, you help us remember that the plan of salvation tells us how much you love us and how important we are in your sight. And I ask that you please help us to emulate the same consideration for you and others, not just in our tithes and offerings, but in everything that we do in every aspect of our lives. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for continuing to bless us and bringing us here safely. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. We'll now have children's story by Benjamin Seraphim. Good morning, children. Good morning, children. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, so I'm gonna need an assistant. That's gonna be Jonathan. So, oh, yeah, sorry. Jonathan, could you get the boxes right over there? Thank you. And just stay up here. Yeah, all right. So, um, can you take the boxes out, actually? Thank you. So can anyone tell me what these are? Can you say that louder? Thank you. Um, and what, what, what do you think is, is inside? Can you say that louder? Thank you. Um, Jonathan, can you shake both of the boxes, please? Do they sound the same? All right, thank you. Do they sound the same or do they sound different? All right, so can you reach in that box, please? Hopefully it's cereal, guys. You know, I didn't eat this morning. What? It's not cereal? Ah, uh, maybe the other one is. Let's check. Ooh, okay. I almost thought I couldn't eat. All right. So you see, sometimes things are always, aren't always what they seem. You know, because our eyes and our um, ears makes us think, oh yeah, because it's a cereal box and they both sound like cereal, they're both cereal, right? But then when Jonathan reached inside, it was penne pasta for one of them and the other one was actually cereal. So sometimes things aren't always what they appear and, be, and we can't be sure as our eyes and ears truly seeing and hearing the things that where they are. There's one thing that we can always be sure of, and that is God's love for each other, one of you and me. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 1 and 11 that faith is to be sure of things that we have not seen. God is as sure as the box of breakfast cereal that has always, that has always breakfast cereal in it. When you have faith in God, you can trust him and believe that he will always take care of you. You cannot collect the offering.
So now can we have Dylan to come up here and pray? Close your eyes and bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Jesus, we want to have faith in you. Teach us to believe in your trust, you even if we can't see you. Thank you for all, always loving us. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 You can all go back to your parents now. Thank you, Brother Seraphin, for that wonderful, wonderful children's story. I, I actually enjoyed that. And I uh, did a wonderful job as well as a uh, prayer by Brother Dylan there. It's very good. Our young people are continuing to grow and mature, and I love it. <clears throat> so we've come to the time where in our service we receive the word of God. Contrary to popular belief, uh, the sermon time is not a sermon. The sermon time is not um, uh, a passive activity. We don't, we, we don't come to um, to watch something, to 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 view a, an event. This part of the service is actually a participatory uh, event, meaning that you've got. Uh, 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 someone that's bringing the word and then you've got folks listening but it's not just listening uh, uh, passive listening it's, it's active listening I pray in my heart today that you know we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to really understand what it is to really participate in the sermon as the sermon is being uh, delivered so I pray that you open up your hearts and minds for the message today um, before our pastor comes and delivers this message, however, we will have a special selection by Van Clyde Avesta. Did I do that right? What a wonderful name. Uh, so will you come forward? plan. It's God and God's alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its true He will be our one desire, a 
hearts will never tire of God and God alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve. And God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God. Let everything that Serve its truest praise for for God and God alone, alone. Amen. Amen. Say amen. Have you been ministered to this morning? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Just imagine what heaven's going to be like. Oh, man. Can't wait. Um, this morning, the title of our message is Grave Errors. And uh, this topic may seem kind of morbid. But it really isn't. Death and the condition of people after they die is a major deception that God warned us about. It's a, the first lie that the devil told in Eden. And he has been deceiving the world ever since the creation. And so... This topic is an important one. And last week, uh, we looked at the issue of can we communicate with our loved ones once they die? And we talked about various industries that have arisen, satanic and otherwise, that are profiting off of this first lie. And so therefore, in part two, we are going to talk about what is the condition of man in death. And uh, we can be comforted with the fact that God knows what's best for us. Amen? And so with that, let's do some review. The state of man in death has been talked about, has been manipulated, has been used throughout the centuries by the forces of evil to deceive mankind. Most pagan religion is based upon this concept of being able to communicate with the dead. Many religions including Christian ones, such as the Roman Catholic Church, venerate the dead. We have animism. We have the worship of dead ancestors and other things that are used as a pretext to deceive people. But the Bible tells us the answers to this question of what happens when a man dies. And the scripture gives us counsel on how we should act toward 
these type of manifestations. In Leviticus 19.31, the Bible says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So God warns us that these deceptions are afoot. And as we pointed out last week, we cannot find a major avenue where there's not a psychic or a medium or some sort of spiritualistic church or group that is attempting to deceive. And the Bible gives us this stern warning found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 12. There shall not be found among you a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer, one who communicates with the dead, supposedly, for all that do these things are a what? Or an abomination unto the Lord. And so the Lord wants us to know that deception is afoot. And just because we see it on the movie screen doesn't mean that we should watch it. Amen? The Lord says don't have anything to do with this. And we know that Hollywood and that whole ilk are part of the satanic deception of the last days. And so what do we do when the pain affects us of the loss of a loved one? The Bible seeks to give us com comfort when we experience this. The Bible says in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forever. Amen? Amen? Jesus is alive forever. He's conquered the tomb. And he will conquer the tomb for those who have passed on who are his children. And he will conquer the tomb for us. Amen? Amen. See, because Jesus was resurrected, we will be resurrected. Job 7 9 and 10 puts it this way, as the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. So our loved ones cannot visit us. It's an imposter. Continuing Job 7, 10, he shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him anymore. So someone is impersonating these people. These dear loved ones, this satanic sick system is seeking to deceive us. Revelation 16, 13, and 14 tells us who it is. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Again, the Bible says, for they are the spirits of what? Demons, fallen angels, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth. And of the whole world to do what? To gather them to the battle of the great day of God. See, the reality is there's a system out there. There's a corrupt, satanically inspired system that is seeking to deceive you and me. See, it's not our loved ones that we see. It's demonic forces gathering for that day. Matthew 24, 4 and 5, Jesus, just before he was murdered and then was put in the grave, said these words. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, he says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will do what? Deceive many. Again, he says, Matthew 24, 23 through 25, he says, Then if 
anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders, and to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Jesus is warning us that in these last days and throughout history, the devil has been using death and the occult for deception. And so therefore, we need to be aware of these things. And the beautiful thing is God has promised us eternal life, right? Amen? He's given us the promise, and his promise is found in John, 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has what? Has given us what? Amen. Amen. We already have an eternal life. And this life is in who? In his son. Amen. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, And he who has the son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And so life is a gift. And 1 John 5.13 confirms it with us again. He says, These things have I written unto you who do what? Believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you what? Have eternal life. Oh, beloved, we can have the assurance of eternal life. And those loved ones who have gone on before us, who sleep in the grave, have the assurance of eternal life. If we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing can touch us. Amen? Amen. So we don't have to worry, and we don't have to be afraid. So let us go now to Grave Errors Part 2. And we're going to look, we're going to see what man's state is in the grave. In 1964, in the Congo, there was a terrible civil war. Dr. Paul Cars Carson's hospital was taken over by rebel forces. Many of the hospital employees were killed, and unfortunately, Dr. Carlson was among them. When his body was found, he had been mercilessly, mercilessly beat to death by the rebels. And he was a, a mission, had a mission station there, you can see it. And they helped the people to feed and to clothe. And they set up wells around the Congo. But the rebels didn't care. And so when they found Dr. Carlson's body, they found a New Testament that was in his pocket. And in that New Testament, if you, if you look there in the corner, he put next to the section of scripture, he said, peace. Dr. Carlson could have peace in the midst of death. Dr. Carlson had the assurance of eternal life. Now, does death make sense to us? No. That's why we struggle so much with it. That's why we have so much pain when we lose a loved one. And the enemy of souls wants to take advantage of that sick. And of course, Dr. Carlson and others started a mission work that has gone on in the Congo. And so their lives were not in vain. There are so many conflicting opinions concerning death today. What really happens to a person when they die? We must be informed by scripture. We must not allow physical, quote, evidence to convince us. We must not allow 
ethereal manifestations to distract us from learning what the Bible says about death. And the loved ones that we lose, we hurt, we have pain. Most unbearable pain. But God wants us to know that he has a solution. See, our hearts and minds weren't wired for death. See, death is an enemy, an interloper, a stealth, the opponent that takes our loved ones from us. See, the, the point is this, is that Jesus even made provision for death. Amen? He has overcome death, and we can overcome as well. See, our loved ones are just where God would have them to be. And we will be there should God tarry. But God marks everyone that dies, and he knows what is best. And so what about this state of death? What happens when a man or a woman dies? The popular teaching is that there's an immortal soul. And I invite you to look for the word immortal soul in the scripture. You will not find it because it's not there. It's a conjured up lie from the enemy of souls. But does the Bible have anything to say about this? Certainly. After Jesus died on the cross, his friends placed his body in the tomb. Pilate, the Roman governor, sent a guard and set a seal, a Roman seal, that included many soldiers so that his body would not be taken. And then, of course, you know what happened? During the night portion of the night, Jesus resurrected. An angel came. And the soldiers were thrown back as dead men, the Bible says. And Jesus was resurrected. The first fruits of them who slept. So Jesus conquered the grave, amen? amen. So there's hope for me and you. See, he conquered the grave. See, the grave, that enemy, that last enemy to be destroyed will be done. See, the story of Jesus' resurrection gave the early church the impetus to move forward. It gave the early church confidence that Jesus is coming again. Amen? See, death was not the final end. For those who put their trust in Christ, death is just a way stop, a stopping point along the way. Amen? Amen. During the first centuries, you see a picture here of the catacombs. And the catacombs were very interesting because Christians were buried there and non-Christians. And on the epitaphs of these catacombs, the pagans would write goodbye forever. They would write, this is the end. There is no more. But the Christians would write such sentiments that were filled with hope, goodbye until we meet again. Goodbye until the morning. And one even said, I will see you at the resurrection. Amen? Amen? So God has a positive message even for those who have died. The Bible says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. God has a message. And Revelation 1.18 puts it this way. He says, I am he who lives and was dead. See, Jesus came back from the dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. 
and I have the keys of what? Hades and death. Hades is the grave. So Jesus has the keys, amen? And whoever has the keys can open the lock, amen? Jesus has the keys. He promises. And so this issue of the resurrection, follow with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 16 to 18 says this, If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain or futile. See, without the resurrection, there is no life. Amen? So, the Bible continues. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have what? Perished. So if there's no resurrection, there's no returning to life. So therefore the teaching that man is immortal when he dies is a false concept. See, because without the resurrection, there is no life. And if there is no life, there is no immortal soul. The Bible says we are yet in our sins. Genesis 3.18 tells us what happened. It says, you shall eat of the herb of the field, and in the sweat of your face shall ye eat bread till you return to the ground. So notice where people return to. They don't return to heaven. They're not ethereal spirits that float up in the never-nether world. They don't go to nirvana. They don't go to purgatory. They rest in the ground. Notice with me again. For out of it you were taken... For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. This is what the Bible teaches. Man rests in the grave. <clears throat> and the Bible helps us to understand it. This is a key to the understanding of what happens in death. Again, the Bible puts it this way. This is how man was formed, Genesis 2, verse 7. This is the word of God, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. What is it? The dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils what? The breath of life. And notice with me what happens. And man became a what? A living soul. And most trans translations say a living being. The word soul there is the word nephesh. It simply means breath or life. Life came into that lifeless piece of clay from God himself. Now let's look at this formula for just a moment. So the body combined with the breath equals what? A living soul or a living being. See, we do not live without the breath and the body combined. Now, if we do the reverse mathematical operation, body minus the breath equals a lifeless corpse. So when the breath of God is taken away, man ceases to live. And as we've seen, the Bible tells us this is so. Notice with me Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. The Bible says this. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. And the spirit or the breath or the nephesh. The same word that's used in Genesis. The breath from God is taken back and man ceases to live. And so the Spirit will return to God who gave it. It's not a soul. 
A soul is not an independent living thing. The life is the combination of the breath of God plus the body of man that was formed by the dust of the ground. Job 27.3 gives us further evidence of this. All the while my breath is in me. What did he, what did he say? The breath, the nephesh, is in me, and the what? The Spirit of God is what? In my nostrils. Just like we saw in Genesis, right? Just like we saw in the other sections of Job. The Bible is consistent. Life consists of the breath of God and the body combined. And when that relationship is ended by the taking of the breath, then life ceases. It's simple as that. And the Bible authors from Genesis to Revelation tells us so. The psalmist in Psalm 146, 3 and 4 tells us this, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is what? No help. There's no help with man. Notice with me, the Bible says this, continuing verse 4, his spirit departs, or the breath, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. This is what the Bible says. So no one's coming back haunting the house. Now, there may be demonic activity, but this is not our loved ones. This is what the Bible teaches. Continuing, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6 tells us this, for the living know that they will die. Like one author put it this way, he says, if you live long enough, you're going to die. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Zip, zero, zilch. And, he continues on, they have no further reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy have now perished. It's gone. God marks the spot where that person is and at the great resurrection, he promises that people will live again, but people will live in their own order. Psalms 115, 17 confirms us again. The dead do not what? Praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. So where is man? In the grave. Sleeping. Job 17, 13 gives us a complete description. He says this, If I wait, the grave is my house. I have made my bed in the darkness. Continuing, he says, If man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait. Where is he waiting? Lying in the grave till what? Till my change come. What is that change? The resurrection. He continues on. Again, Job 14, 15, he says, You shall call and I will what? Answer you. Now, how is he answering? He's answering because he's resurrected. Remember, 1 Thessalonians Four, verses 16 and following, that that trumpet will sound and the dead will raise. Incorruptible. At the last trump, at the trump of the archangel. Jesus is calling or will call all of those who have died to him, those who love and serve him. Again, Job 14, 
verses 10 to 13, gives us a vivid description of man and death. But man dies and is what? Laid away. Did it say he went up to realms of glory? Did it say that he went to hell and burned forever? Not so. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. Have you ever been in a room when someone dies? The last thing you hear is, because oh, the breath that God gave them is taken back. Now, did God intend death? No. No, death is an enemy that will be conquered. He breathes his last, and where is he? So man lies down and does not rise till what? The heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. There's that word sleep again. We've heard it over and over again. From Genesis to Revelation, death is compared to a sleep where man sleeps in the grave until the resurrection. Either the resurrection of accommodation or the resurrection of damnation. So everyone will see life again. God promises this is what he says in Job 14, 13 again. Notice with me, this is the prophet Job. This is the inspired prophet. He says, oh, that you would hide me where? In the grave. That you would conceal me into your wrath is past. So our loved ones are not looking down on us, seeing all the hardship and pain that we're facing. Our loved ones are asleep in the grave. Just like you go to bed at night and you wake up in the morning when the alarm clock sounds, it seems like you had just gone to sleep. That's the state of man in death. God is giving the wicked even peace in death. Amen? How good is our God? And then he goes on. Job 14, 13 again, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. So what is that set time? That set time is when Jesus comes again. Amen. He has a set time. Psalms 13, verse 3 tells us this. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Notice the two words here. Sleep and death are used interchangeably. So we know what the Bible teaches is true. Death is a sleep. It's a cessation of life until the resurrection. Daniel 12, 2 tells us this. Notice with me, this is the great blessed hope and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall what? Awake. Oh, it's time to get up. That great morning time has come. The resurrection, that time that we waited for, the blessed hope, the apostle Paul tells us. Notice with me, this is the order, Daniel 12, 2. Some to what? Everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. Jesus said, behold, my reward is with me and when I come, he will have it. Amen. See, the prophet David in the scripture. Prophet Samuel helped him to understand the fullness of death. He noticed what he says, when, the, when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. 
In Acts chapter 2, we've been going over it in prayer meeting, and I want to invite you to prayer meeting. We've been having a good time together, haven't we? Amen? Amen. I want you to come out and be with us because prayer meeting's where we dissect the Word, amen, and we get down into the text and we look at it. We're looking at the book of Acts, and we want you to join us. <clears throat> but the prophet David was told by Samuel that when your life ends, you will sleep. That's 66 times in the Scripture. Sleep and death are combined. So we don't have to be deceived. We don't have to wander. The Bible tells us what the state of man is in death. Now, I want to give you a biblical example in closing this afternoon. I want to show you from the lips of Jesus and from a Bible story what the state of man is in death. Notice with me John eleven five, 5. And if you'll turn there with me in your Bibles, let's take a look at it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, a little background. Bethany was the place where they lived, and Jesus frequently visited them. And then something happened to Lazarus. Lazarus became sick and died. And the Bible continues, John 11, 11, our friend Lazarus sleeps. What did Jesus say? He sleeps. But I go that I may wake him. Notice the words there, sleep and wake. Were they not the same words that Job used? Weren't they the same words that Samuel used? Wasn't they the same words that people used all through the Old Testament? Because some people will tell you there's a change in the New Testament. Not so. There's no change. God treats everyone the same. Amen? Amen? So notice what he says here. So, so the disciples were kind of confused. And they said this to the Lord Jesus. They said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. See, they didn't understand. They didn't understand the fullness of what Jesus was going to do. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Sleep, death, dead. These are the words of the Savior. This is not modern theologians parsing the word of God here. This is the master himself. This is the creator of life telling us the state of man in death. So Lazarus is dead. Then he continues John 11, verses 14 and 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may what? Believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. And you know the story. The, the Bible narrative tells us that he had been dead for four days. And then he finally arrives and he meets Martha and Mary. And notice what is said here. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She understood the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Because the Lord Jesus Christ can raise people from the dead. Amen? Again, continue it. Verse 11, 23. Jesus says this, your brother will, what? Rise again. He didn't say your brother's in heaven there with the angels because he's been dead for four days. See, the Jews believed that if someone wasn't resurrected in, in three days on the fourth day, it was impossible. 
And so Jesus waited to show what power he has. Amen? The Lord has the power to raise us even from the dead. Your brother will rise again. Notice her response. This is someone that knows the word of God. Notice what she says. She says, I know that he will what? Rise again in what? In the resurrection at what? The last day. See, the last day on earth is going to be when Jesus comes. Amen? So Martha and Mary, they knew. They knew that this man laid in the grave and Jesus had the power to raise him. And they knew when it was. It wasn't when you die. It's when Jesus comes again in the first resurrection. See, at the last day, because he was a believer, amen. Jesus had shared the gospel with him or someone else, and they were saved, amen. They were walking in Christ. So this is what is going to happen by the word of God. I want to remind you, this is not Pastor Versus' words. This is the word of God. Again, he says, I am a go e me. I am the resurrection and the what? The life. So who is the resurrection and the life? Jesus. He who believes in me, though he may die, he what? Shall live. Amen. Amen. Now the shortest verse in Scripture, John eleven thirty five. 35, notice this. Jesus wept. We talked a little bit about this. Jesus wept because of the pain that we go through when we lose a loved one. I want you to know, beloved, if you have a loved one that's passed on, Jesus knows about it. Jesus wept. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus, but he also knows the pain that everyone feels when we lose a loved one. And he's there to comfort, and he's there to let you know that he cares. Jesus wept. But you know, one day all that weeping's going to go away. Amen? Notice with me, John eleven thirty nine. 39. But Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. That mournful group. But see, Jesus is not dependent on pre-existent matter to raise someone from the dead. Amen? Because any dust all over the earth can be made to live. Amen? So people who are lost at sea and people who have been in tragic accidents and they've been consumed by fire or whatever, God knows the place of that person. Amen? So the reality is, is we don't have to worry about pre-existing matter. That's in God's hands. See, Jesus asked that the stone that sealed the entrance to the grave be taken away. And Jesus did that wonderful deed. That deed where he says, Lazarus, come forth. One Bible author puts it this way. She says that if he would have just said, come forth, all of the dead throughout the ages would have risen. Lazarus is a sample, is a first fruit. Amen? Jesus conquered the grave, and we can know that we can live again. We can live again. And Lazarus, you know, 
that the Pharisees, they planned to kill him, didn't they? You find in the Bible that they wanted to kill him because of this mighty manifestation of God's work with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what is the solution to the matter? The Bible tells us that at the great resurrection that all those who are in Christ will be raised. God has promised that those who hurt will be comforted. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 16 says this, but I do not want you to be ignorant. That's uninformed. That's not pejorative. God wants us to know, and the Apostle Paul says, concerning those who have what? Oh, did we see that before? Fallen asleep. It's the same thing. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the New Testament. This is the New Testament revelation of the state of man in death. The Apostle Paul is restating what was given all through the Old Testament. See, no change. No purgatory. No burning in the flames of ember forever. No walking around in heaven there are a few people in heaven. But the Bible says this. Notice with me. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Like those pagans in the catacombs, they had no hope. Because the only hope in the world is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved. Hallelujah. Man, we should be happy. We're going to live again. For the Lord himself will what? Descend from heaven with what? With a shout. With the voice, the phony of the archangel, Lord Jesus. He's going to wake us up himself. Amen. Archangel and with the what? The trump of God and what? The dead in Christ will what? Rise first. There's eternal life given. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55 says this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. If something is told, then it's not a mystery anymore, is it? See, the reality is that one of the most comforting truths is that man will sleep in the grave until the resurrection. Either the resurrection to eternal life or the resurrection to damnation. And so the reality is, is God gives us a choice. Every day we have a choice. Where there's life, there's hope. And the Bible tells us that this mystery will be solved. This mystery will be solved. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55, we shall not all, what? Sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, why won't we all sleep? Because there will be some alive when Jesus comes, and we will be translated without seeing death. Amen? I want to be one of those, don't you? I want to be waiting here when the Lord Jesus comes and he shouts and the trump happens and then we'll float up in the air. Amen. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. So the Bible tells us from Genesis to Revelation, again, he further emphasizes, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, what? Incorruptible. You know, guess, guess what? When I'm raised, I'm not going to have a broken back anymore, amen? I'm not going to have pain that shoots up and down my legs anymore. We're going to be whole. We're going to be whole, folks. 
And all those whom we waited for, those who serve the Lord, who have died in Jesus Christ, will come to life. Amen. I can't wait to that first fellowship dinner. Amen. Oh, man. Think about it. Again, he says, uh, 52, for this corruptible must put on what? Incorruption, and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. Amen. We're going to live forever. For so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, notice with me, then, when, then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Amen. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It's gone. Mom and dad are not there anymore. Mom and dad are not suffering. Mom and dad are waiting for the resurrection. Brother and sister, you're going to see them again. Amen. And we're going to be happy, and we're all going to be together. That's what the Bible is telling us. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh. John reminds us, notice with me, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's the Bible view of death. And I want you to know that I have not strayed from the Bible. We've just used the Bible itself. I've not brought in um, tradition. I've not brought in what my church teaches even though my church teaches this, amen? But this is what the Bible shares with us about death. And the Bible gives us this admonition found in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Read it with me. And behold, I am coming quickly, amen? And my reward is with me to give everyone according to his or her work. I don't mind getting, getting the horse on this one. Amen. Amen. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible tells us this. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. That is the promise. So can we have comfort in death? Do we have pain? Yes, we do. Is it sometimes so hard that we can't stand it? But God has promised, my grace is sufficient for you. Go to God. Talk to God. He has the comforting words that we need when we lose a loved one. And he's promised us that if that loved one is in Christ, we will see them again. And where he is, there we may be also. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so sad to see the carnage and death of this world. But Lord, you've conquered death and the grave. And Lord, you have the keys to the grave and to eternal life. And Lord, this life is in your son. It's in that relationship with you. So, Lord, help us. Help us this morning to understand that you have a place for our loved ones. And, Lord, also that we can live forever. And we can be in that eternal kingdom that will never end. And all the stress and problems and troubles and sickness and all that that's in this earth will be done. Oh God, may each one of us choose. Choose you right now and say to you, Lord, we want an eternal life. So give us this life 
and this life is in his son. So help us, Lord, to make that surrender to you right now. In the privacy of the corridors of our own mind, we can talk to you. So, Lord, bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
start, we just want to thank you for the message that was given to us today. Uh, timely message, Lord, as, uh, as we look at um, the Bible verses that were presented to us in the City National Session line. If we move down to verses 16 and 17, it talks about wisdom, and that wisdom is better than strength, more powerful than strength. And where do we find wisdom? Wisdom comes from the Lord. So help us, Lord, to lean on you for wisdom and not wisdom. you and keep 